Rahim, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How is everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. We'll start off with the announcements first. Um, we make dua for the people of uh, KZN. They're going through a lot of difficulty at the moment, subhanAllah, a lot of floods. SubhanAllah, you watch the videos, very scary. We've got friends of mine, um, are they out of electricity, out of water? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect uh, and make, make it easy. Once again, we realize that if Allah withholds the rain, like we had in Cape Town, no one can bring the rain. And if Allah sends the rain, no one can make the rain stop. So may Allah out of His mercy in this month of mercy, ya Allah, let Allah rain upon us, beneficial rain around us and not upon us. I mean, then a uh, couple of announcements. Uh, it is uh, coming towards the middle of the month and for those who need to pay uh, fidya, now remember fidya is for the person who is unable to fast at all. So he can't pay in after Ramadan, he's too sick or too old or as a, uh, you know, too sick meaning he has a permanent illness. So they would pay a fidya, 17 rand for every day they miss, right? 17 rand and the majid will collect and then distribute it to the poor in terms of food. You're not supposed to give money. Fidya cannot be given money. So if you give 17 rand to a poor person, that's not okay. But if you buy a, a happy meal and you give it to a person, that's okay, alhamdulillah. And then as for um, fitra, fitra is the, uh, the zakah that you pay at the end of Ramadan for every single person that you are responsible for. So if you're the head of the household, you have a wife, kids, your old parents, you support them. For every single person, you need to pay a fitra. The minimum, uh, and there's differences of opinion on how much it should be. 67 rand is the Shafi opinion, inshallah, this is much better. It's the higher rate. The Hanafi opinion, 27 rand, it's, it's a little bit less. But this is what is to make sure every single poor person, every Muslim on the day of Eid has something to eat as well. Okay? Uh, Sorry, the Shafi is 27, but it's better to do the 67. It's better to do the 67, okay? It's better to do the 67, inshallah. Then um, someone asked me um, after, after Salah. Actually, the, the, the slide must be updated. I'm pretty sure it's the other way around. The Shafi is 67. Shafi is more than the Hanafi. And it's a long story why. It um, goes down to the measurement. In the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you didn't have kilograms. You had, you know, hand spans. And so... Later scholars tried to extrapolate how many kilos should it be. And so you'd find the Shafi Madhab has a higher fitra and a lower fidya, whereas the Hanafi Madhab fitra and fidya is almost uh, in line. So inshallah, the 67 is the Shafi opinion and alhamdulillah it's better. But for the one who's too, who is unable to afford the 67, then there are the pay 27 rand fitra. That's what, 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 is what we suggest here. Then someone asked me, subhanAllah, now everyone knows I came late for Ishai. I performed four raka'ahs in Taraweeh and it's permissible. That if you miss the Isha'i, then you join the Jama'ah and your niyyah is Isha'i while the Jama'ah is making Taraweeh, it's permissible. The time of Nabi Sallallahu as we'll get to know, there's a great Sahabi, Mu'ad ibn Jabal. He would lead Salah with the Nabi Sallallahu and then he would come and perform as an Imam, Asr again, the same Salah with his community, with his tribe. So he was performing a Sunnah Salah and the people behind him were performing Fard. That's permissible, Inshallah. But moral of the story, come on time. Come on time. <laughs> right. We continue with our series, Mercy to the Worlds. Um, the Nabi Sallallahu So yesterday we, we mentioned the Hijrah and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi with the grace of Allah was able to escape Mecca and now arrives to Medina and the city is overjoyed, the happiest day. That very, that very famous Sahabi, and again you must know these Sahaba, Anas radiallahu anh, he was six years old when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi entered Medina and he becomes the servant boy, not really the slave, Anas's mother comes and as people are gifting him food and drinks and whatever, she says, here's my boy Anas, he's six years old. Whatever you need, just send Anas, he'll fit you. So Anas gets the lucky opportunity to always be around the Nabi Sallam. He said, for the next 10 years, I was his uh, servant and the happiest day of my life was the day that he came to Medina. And Anas lives to almost 100 and he said there was no day happier than that. The Nabi Sallam now brings together a new city, a new peoples out of in the midst of Jahiliya, a new community. And many, many years later, around 20 years later, the Muslims, when they are the dominant civilization on earth, when they are the dominant civilization on earth, they need to, they realize we don't need to take anyone's calendar anymore. We don't need a Roman calendar or Persian calendar. They just choose our own calendar, the, the Muslim calendar. And so Sayyidina Umar called the Sahaba together. What date should be year number one? Some said, let's take the birth of Nabi Sallallahu like the Gregorian character, the birth of Jesus. We don't like that. Some said the death of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Badr. And then it was Sayyidina Ali that said, let's choose the Hijrah. Because that was the, that was the moment when Allah brought us together as a people. That is really our, the start of our story when we became strong and the Sahaba agreed on that. And then they agreed that Muharram will be the first month of the year. Why? Because it's the month of the Hajj. 
So at the end of Hajj, you start a new beginning and your life is sort of a new, a new, a new page. So Muharram became the beginning of the year and the Hijrah became year number one. And the first thing that Nabi Zim did, of course, he built those masajid even before his own home. And I forgot to mention yesterday the story of the Adhan. So when they f built the masjid, and, and, and interesting, the masjid didn't have a roof on. He, uh, the Nabi Sallallahu said, we need to, how are we going to call the people to? Uh, to, the, to, the, to the masjid. Remember, there were no masjids before this. In Mecca for 13 years, everyone was making salah in secret. You couldn't call out the adhan. So some said, let us use a bell like the Christian or a, a horn called the shofar. Actually, it's what the, what the Jews call it to call them to uh, um, the synagogue. And they all disagreed. They don't want to copy anyone else's civilization. And so two Sahaba, Sayyidina Umar and another Sahabi, they had the exact same dream where someone told them when you want to call some, when you want to bring them people to the masjid, then they repeat these words, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and the Adhan. And so they informed the Nabi Sallallahu we had this dream. And so the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, this is a sign from Allah that this should be our call to prayer. And then he said, call Bilal, teach him the Adhan because he has the strongest voice. And subhanAllah, as he was calling Ahadun Ahadun in Mecca, he was the one calling the Adhan for the next 10 years in Medina. He was the official Mu'addin of the Ummah, subhanAllah, the number one Mu'addin. Till today we call us the Bilals here, right? Alhamdulillah. If we look at the city now, now comes the real work of establishing a community. The city of Medina has a number of problems. You have a, the demographics, you have Muslims from Ansar, the Ansar being the people of Medina, the originals of Medina, the Arabs. Then you have the Muhajireen. The Muhajireen are about 250 people, 300 people. But this is a lot. Think about the Bukab. If you had 300 people coming in as refugees in the Bukab, it would be a huge crisis in the area. Where do we put these people? Where do they live? And then, of course, we still had, there are a sizable Jewish, one-third of Medina was a Jewish population. This is, this is new. Now you see, what do we do when we're in control? Do we force them to become Muslim? What do we do to them? And you had a small group of people that were still pagans. They're still idol worshippers. Okay, very small community. What is Nabi going to do with them? And so the crisis he had to solve, the first thing that Nabi Sallam had to do was uh, economical, social. We have to give people houses, food. We need to solve these things. You can bacha till you're blue in the face, but if your stomach is hungry, it's not going to solve the problem. And then what do we do with all these non-Muslims in our community and the external threats? And so the first thing that Nabi Sallallahu did, and it's really something for us to, to think about how we solve a poverty problem, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not enforce anyone, did not force anyone, the rich, you will pay to the poor. What he did was he made the, sim, the system of mu'aha. You just see to one person, and you just see to one person. And that is going to be your brother in Islam. I'm not, no one, Allah is not going to tell you how much to give, how little to give. You just take care of one another. And Allah mentions the, this, this bond that he placed between the people of Mecca and Medina. Allah says, Lil fuqara, the poor al-muhajireen. The poor muhajireen who immigrated, ukhriju, they were kicked out of their homes, min diyarihim, and they lost wa amwalihim. They lost everything. Yabatakuna fadlam min Allah. They gave up everything for the fadl of Allah and his pleasure. Wa yansurullah wa rasulah. Ula'ika sadiqun. And Allah testifies that the muhajireen are the highest caliber of people. They basically sacrificed everything. The only thing left is their lives. They've given up everything at, up to this point. Then Allah says, the next ayah, And as for those, الدار, That they prepared the home, the home of the ummah. They love this people of Medina. They love the muhajireen that came to them. And they find nothing in their heart of any animosity, why are you people coming and taking our homes and taking our money? Mimma utu, and they give ala, ala anfusihim, walau kana bihim khasasa. They give to the muhajireen in spite of them needing it. They would first make sure that the muhajireen eat, that the muhajireen have a place to stay before themselves. Now, subhanAllah, this is a high, high level of iman. The point, this was so you know, evident, the hospitality of the people of Medina that the muhajirin came to complain to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, we have never seen a people like this. And we are scared that they have taken all the rewards from Allah. They have beaten us completely. Yeah, Allah, what is left for us in terms of reward? And then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't worry, Allah is enough. There is enough of Allah's reward to give to anyone. And then Allah says, innamal mu'minuna ikhwa, that you are now a unique people on earth. Before everyone was associated by family, by blood, by tribe, by country, whatever it is, this Allah says you are now one community, irrespective of race, irrespective of color. You are a nation unto yourself. That the Muslims are a brother to a Muslim is a brother to his brother, and they constitute one ummah. The word ummah, where does it come from? Where does the word ummah come from? Sounds like um mother, like you are born from one mother. 
imam also comes from that because you all have one direction you have one cost one objective so it's as if the Allah is saying more than your biological ties your ties of Islam is like you are born from one mother you are one nation and then we know and this is where so many of the hadith that we find about brotherhood that the, um, the Muslims are like one body if one if the finger gets hurt or the eye gets hurt, the entire body feels the pain. This is where we find the context of this hadith. Nabi Sallam is trying to establish uh, that you all, you have, you need to look after each other. And so we look at the attitude of the Ansar and we learn about the Subhanallah. So it's nice to learn the stories. But now I ask you if that Bangladeshi or that Somali comes and knocks on your door, how do we react? How do we react? Just something for us to think about. Our brother from across the world comes in need of, of something. How would we act? Would we even, if we are just to give a few rents to get rid of him, maybe. To appease our guilt. But to actually let the person in our house, to actually say, take my bed, take my, I prefer you over me. Subhanallah, this is, now we imagine the level of Iman. And they didn't know these people, right? And one of the best, the most uh, uh, telling example of this is, where Abdurrahman ibn Awf was a muhajir and, and, and Sa'ad radiallahu was an Ansari, the Nabi sallam bonded them together. Very interesting also, the Nabi sallam handpicked, you and you are compatible. And he put like-minded Sahaba together. And so even, even though a, a time would come when the muhajirin won't need this kind of support, that bond would remain for life. They would have a special brotherhood with each other. They would take care of each other even after the financial need. And so Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he was bonded with the wealthiest man in Medina. Why? Because in Mecca, Abdurrahman was a super wealthy man. And he gave up everything in the Hijrah. He lost everything. So when, when Abdurrahman meets his counterpart, right? So one, one millionaire to another. But now Abdurrahman is not anymore. He's, uh, he's got no money. So Sa'ad says, MashaAllah, look, I'm the wealthiest guy in Medina. Take half of my house. Take half of my plantation, half of my assets. He even said, take half of my wives. Choose the one you want. I'll divorce her and you marry her. Right? That's so Abdul Rahman said, Barakallah, may Allah reward you in your family. I don't need this. Just show me where's the suit. Just show me where the market is. I got a few coins in my pocket and he started his own business. And within in a while, he became uh, wealthy in his own right. The Nabi Sallam bumps into him and says, Yeah, Abdul Rahman, you look all dressed up. So he said, Yeah, I got, I, it's my wedding day. I just got married to an Ansari girl. So I got enough money. I got one of the local girls, got married to her. And so the Nabi Sallam said, MashaAllah, Barak, well done. Make sure you give a walima. But invite me also, subhanAllah, right? <laughs> subhanAllah. So, we see the attitude of the Ansar and the attitude of the, the Muhajirin did not want handouts. The honor and the Izza determined, d dictated, we will work hard for what we want. And the Nabi Sallallahu did not impose on any of them. And SubhanAllah, again, his wisdom. When the Ansar gave their homes, he didn't stop them. When, he, when they gave their food, he didn't stop them. When they wanted to give their plantations, he said, stop. Because he understood the Muhajirin can't operate farms. If the Muhajirin took the farms and they don't know how to work it, there's going to be a food crisis. So he said, the Ansar, you know how to ha keep the, the plantations. And maybe there's a word. I always think of nationalization when we talk about this kind of, uh, subhanAllah, not to get political. So this is the Muslims, the Muslim Ummah. The Nabi is building this bond. And really, you cannot find an altruistic society, a more altruistic society in history than this moment in Islam. And this can only be from Allah. In the ayah, Allah says in the Quran, if you had spent the world in gold, to bring their hearts together, you wouldn't have done it. This is a really a miracle from Allah. These people remember the Ansar, not the Muhajirin. The Ansar were killing one another for hundreds of years. Now they let foreigners come in and they share everything, even though over their own family. Allahu Akbar. Now we need to deal with the non-Muslims in Medina. And again, we see the truth, the, the real, you know, uh, essence of Islam here. And we see the, 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 the truthfulness, the, how do we interact with non-Muslims? Of the first things that Nabi Muhammad did is he called the, the leadership of the non-Muslims, the Jews and the pagans and the idol worshippers. And he said, let us agree on a constitution. SubhanAllah, this is unknown. This is 1,500 years ago. We are going to agree a constitution where he first says that the Muslims are one ummah, the Muhajirin and the Ansar, we are one ummah and we are a unique people and our laws are for us. And the Jews, he then, the highest people on the list after the Muslims, you, the Jews, are a people like us. With us, you are a nation unto yourselves. Your laws, your rituals, your customs, you have your own sharia. We will not interfere. So, very interestingly, in Medina, when Kham, and this is an Islamic law, when you are in an Islamic state, it is haram for the Muslim to drink alcohol. But your, your Christian friend, he can drink his alcohol, he can manufacture his alcohol. There is no crime on them. So they were freely allowed to live and practice their religion. And the Nabi Sallallahu 
also put in there that if anyone wants to harm the Jews, we will defend them. And similarly, if anyone harms the Muslims, the Jews are required to support us. As for the pagans, now we've been at war with the pagans for 13 years. There's been a whole in Mecca. The Nabi Sallallahu also said that the pagans have their rights. And the only thing that not, they're not allowed to do is ally with the Quraysh. You cannot be... You cannot have any treaties with them. You cannot support them because we are at war with the Quraysh. So you can worship your idols. La ikraha fa We're not going to force anyone into any religion. But you cannot be an ally with our enemies. And then the Nabi said, if there is one, anyone, a Muslim, a Jew, a pagan, he commits any crime that goes against Medina, then we will all unite against him. If it's a Muslim that hurt a Jew, then we will bring him to justice and vice versa. And if there is any dispute between anyone, ultimately the Nabi would be the arbitrator. Now, this is, subhanAllah, light years ahead of any civilization that was at that time. And we talk about religious tolerance, subhanAllah. Interesting side note, that when the founding fathers of America wrote the American Constitution, and, and uh, all about religious freedom, they wanted to emulate what the Ottomans had, the Ottomans. Because in the Ottoman lands, you had Jews, Christians. I mean, subhanAllah, the Christian and the Jewish population, they're still there. What happened? More than 1,500 years in our lands. Whereas in Europe... You had the Inquisition, you had persecutions, the Jews, the, everyone was persecuted. This deen of ours is one of tolerance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as we know, la ikraha fi deen. You cannot force anyone into religion. And so the Nabi sallam, to show how he would lead by example, he told them that when we practice the law, it will be fair on everyone, no favoritism. That what destroyed the people of old was that there was one group of people who had a easy law, the higher class, and in the lower class people, they were taken harshly. He says, Wallahi, even if Fatima, my daughter, were to steal, I will personally cut off her hand. That this is the law, is the law. No exceptions. And so he led by that example. Now we see that the Nabi Sallallahu when he's in control, what, how, he, how, he, uh, uh, how he's running his city. There were two very interesting conversions which really gives our strength in our Iman about, about the Nabi Sallallahu The first was a, a rabbi and the second was something of a Christian. So the chief rabbi of Medina, so look, the, the Jews in Medina had uh, ulama, they had a MJC, they had uh, their own imams and, and, and rabbis. And one of the main rabbis of Medina, his name was Abdullah ibn Salam. So naturally when they heard a prophet was there, and they obviously understand what a prophet is, the people said, hey, Sheikh Mawlana, you need to go and see this guy. He's claiming to be a Nabi. And so Abdullah ibn Salam, he gives us the hadith in Bukhari. He says, on the day the Nabi arrived, I wanted to meet him, I wanted to get to him, but I couldn't because the crowd was just too much. The zahma was too big. I had to look at him from a distance. And when I saw his face, I knew already this was not the face of a liar. So this was a man of taqwa. And when you have iman, you recognize this nur in the Nabi Sallallahu face. And then he said, the first thing I heard the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi say, the first speech he gave was, Afshu Salam, oh people, Afshu Salam, all of you spread peace. And it's amazing that he comes to conquer the city. And the first thing he says is, be peaceful, everyone. Muslims, Jews, we be peaceful people. Give salam to everyone. Make, there's no fighting now. Afshu salam wa atimu ta'am and feed one another. Make sure everyone is fed. No one should be hungry. And wa silul arham and keep your family close. Connect your family. Wa sallu wa nasu niyam. And then make salah when everyone is sleeping at night. Tadakul jannata bis salam. And then you'll enter jannah of Allah very, very easily. The dots. Now again, uh, that was then, but it applies to us now. So maybe you think for yourself, give salam. We can maybe do that. Wherever you see someone, assalamu alaikum. Feed people. Make sure every day maybe you give someone a slice of bread who's hungry. Wasilul arham. Keep your family relations close. Have good relations with your family. Wasallu wa nasu niyam. Try maybe half an hour before fajr to wake up and make tajjud. You will enter jannah easily. The Nabi says you will get into jannah simply. Pass the exam very quickly. Subhanallah. So this is the first thing Abdullah bin Salam heard from the Nabi Sallam and he was convinced that this is not a charlatan. And so he got into a discussion with the Nabi Sallam. We even have the questions he asked him. He said, what is the, uh, uh, um, the first, the, 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 the last event, the last of the major signs of Qiyamah or that will begin the end of the world? And the Nabi Sallam said, a fire which will gather all people to one place, the remaining people. And he said, what is the first thing the people of Jannah would eat? And he mentioned that. And how does, so he quizzed the Nabi Sallam about certain things which eventually the Nabi obviously passed and then he said, Ashadu wa la ilaha, I bear witness that you are a Nabi. And then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi asked him, what is your relationship with the Jews? Even how high up, how big of a sheikh are you? So he said, if you ask my people, they'll say that I'm the best of them. 
And, uh, but if they yeah, I'm a Muslim, they're not going to be happy. And so a group of Jews came to the Nabi Sallam and then he asked him, what do you say about Abdullah ibn Salam? And so this is in Bukhari, they said, he is the best of us and the son of the best of us. And so then the Nabi Sallam said, what if I said to you, he became a Muslim? They said, Audhu Billah, it'll never happen. They said, but when he came out, I am a Muslim. They said, you are the worst of us and the son of the worst of us. And so subhanAllah, Abdullah bin Salam, as we said, a rabbi, learned in, the, uh, learned in the book, as Allah says, they recognize him as they recognize their own sons. He was of the first converts in Medina. The next convert, inshallah, we end up with the story of Salman al-Farisi. Amazing story. Remember we said the Persians were the most advanced civilization on earth. Medina is a little city in the middle of nowhere, like a dorpy in the Karoo. And in the, imagine you come into the town and you see there a person from Sweden or a person from well, what are you doing here, subhanAllah? How, how did you end up here, you know? And, uh, you know, so once this man, the strange Persian guy, he comes to the Nabi Sallam and he gives him some dates. Nabi Sallam gives it out and he gives him some dates another day. And then he sees, you know, he's trying to look behind the Nabi Sallam, on the back of Nabi Sallam, with that special birthmark, the seal of Nabuwa. So the Prophet Sallam takes off his shirt and he shows it to Salman. And Salman grabs him and begins to cry like a baby. Crying. So the Nabi Sallam's like, what's going on? Tell us your story. So Salman says, I've been looking for you basically my whole life. I've been looking for this moment my whole life. And then he says that I was, I was from Persia. I, I was the son of the governor of a certain town. I was like a little Bilal. I would be in the masjid, in the temple to light the fire. That was my job. I remember the Persians worship fire. So it was my job to keep the fire burning. I was a very devout Majusi, fire worshiper. Until one day I went on a trip into Syria and I came into a church. And I realized the religion of Christianity is better than our religion. And so I embraced Christianity as a teenager. When my dad found out, he was so upset with me and he kept me locked up, but I escaped and I ran away from home. He made a type of hijrah. And he ran into the Christian lands and he began living in the monastery. And so he spent his time living in a monastery with an old priest. And uh, long story short, basically every time you would come to a specific uh, church, the priest would tell him, my son, I'm about to die. I'm an old man. This religion, that, that this type of Christianity is not the, is about to go extinct. So, but I have a colleague who lives in that country. And so Salman goes from church to church, monastery to monastery, living a few months here and there until he meets a priest in, 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 in Palestine. And that priest says, my son, this is the end. There is no more of us like anymore that, work, that practice correct Christianity. The only thing I can advise you, we are waiting for the coming of a final prophet. There are certain signs you need to look for. He will come in the land of the Arabs, in a city between two lava plains. Now, Medina is between two volcanoes, interesting, between two fires, and it is filled with date trees. He will have a special birthmark on the back of his, between his shoulder blades. He will never ever be allowed to eat charity, but he will he'll take a gift. If you give him a gift, he'll take it. But if it's charity, he's not allowed to take charity. So these are the signs that we know of this man. And so Salman, determine I want to find this last Nabi. He meets a group of Arabs. He says, look, I've got some money. Can you take me to Arabia, to a land like this? They said, no problem. And on the way, subhanAllah, we know the story. They, Salman says, they wronged me. They stole my money. They put chains on me and they made me a slave. And so they sold me. Now, pause for a second. You were living in a palace and now you are here. What did it gone through your mind? This is how I'm being punished. I should have remained a fire worshiper. This is a bala that Allah has put on me. But he gets sold back and forth. And then he says, I find myself in this land. I don't know what it is it's called Yathrib. And I come to the city and I think, okay, it is a land of date trees between two volcano plains. Maybe there's a prophet here. He gets there, no Nabi. There's no one here, no prophet. And he is meant to work on a plantation and he works on a plantation for years. And he says, one day I'm sitting in the tree pulling off the dates when someone screams, there's a man who claims to be a Nabi. He says, I almost fell out of the tree. Right? I almost fell down a tree. I ran down and it took me. I asked my master, can I meet this prophet? Master said, no, you only worry about my prophet. You don't have to worry about anything else. And so the Salman says, I, I managed to scrape together a few dates, went to the Nabi Salam and said, yeah, you know, Muhammad, uh, you look like you people I need. Yeah, some charity. And I said, I watched. You gave out every date, but you didn't take one for yourself. I watched, I noticed. Then the next time I came, I said, this is a gift from, from me, and you ate from it. And now I saw that birthmark. And so he, of course, becomes a Muslim, Salman al-Farisi. Immediately the Nabi says, how are we going to get Salman uh, free? The Jewish man said, you, Salman, no problem, you can get free. You need to plant 300 date palms. And when they grow up, 
That is when you'll be free, subhanAllah. So the Nabi said, let us help Salman. And they all planted the date trees. And he said, before you close it, let me make a special dua. And he made a dua on each one of those trees. Within one season, those plants grew. And Salman, radiallahu anhu al-Farisi, was set free. Uh, and subhanAllah, once again, from two different sources, from the Christian source and the Jewish source, once again, we see the truthfulness of Nubuwa, of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu We continue tomorrow, inshallah. Um, the clue for the crossword um, also, our orphan program, sorry, our orphan program. For those who would like to support our orphan program, we're, having, um, we're hosting 57 orphans on the 16th of April, um, giving them a day out to the planetarium and just a day out, subhanAllah, think how difficult it is to be an orphan, and of course some uh, barakat and whatever it is. If you'd like to sponsor an orphan or, or two, uh, it's 350 rand, please, inshallah. Then our crossword puzzle, the clue for six across is six across, the angel of Jahannam. What is his name? The keeper of Jahannam. And then yesterday's... Uh, draw i don't have it here and um today's question what is the name of the the rab, the chief rabbi that embraced islam what is the name of the chief rabbi that embraced islam we'll do the draw tomorrow okay we'll do the draw quickly 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 <laughs> Maaf, I forgot. let's see bismillah rida isaacs rida isaacs is here rida is that you Oh, mashallah. Barak to you. Shukran. Okay, we continue tomorrow. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.